I feel very honored that you came to join us this morning and appreciate that, that you're taking your time to do that. I think well, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm only sorry we can't do it in person. I wish we could. Um, I'd just like to, to ask, you know, we'll start off by asking the simple question. Why did you feel necessary to write this book? Why did you initiate this project? Um, well, uh, I've been following Facebook since pretty early in its history. Uh, I met Mark Zuckerberg in 2006. Uh, it was only two years old and he was barely more than two years old. He, he actually was uh, 19 uh, and followed its growth. But it wasn't until late August of 2015 I think the date was August 28th, 2015, that I realized I had to write a book about Facebook. And that was when Mark Zuckerberg posted, uh, and it showed up on my newsfeed, he posted on Facebook, that a billion people had been on Facebook the previous day, in the previous 24 hours. And that really struck me. You know, a billion is a sizable chunk of the world's population. And sometimes you hear that maybe uh, the World Cup gets a billion viewers uh, or the Oscars or some event like that. Um, but that's only kind of like a, a one-time spike. Um, for Facebook, it was going to be a baseline. It was only growing. And what's more, unlike watching a television event, this was a network where any person, any one of those billion people could express themselves uh, to any one other person on the network or everyone on the network. It was in theory, uh, you could post something and millions and millions and millions of people would say it. You could be publishing to millions. And I realized that was something new in human history to wire together so much of the population of all humans. And again, it was just getting bigger and bigger. And I realized, wow, what does that mean? How did that happen? And, you know, what, how's the world going to change from that? And who are these people who are doing it? So I thought the only way to do that was to be, write a book, dive in. And I really needed the cooperation of Facebook to really get the full story. I mean, you could do a story without their cooperation, but I wanted to hear from them. And it took me a year to get them to agree to talk to me, give me access to all their employees, and to uh, tell their former employees who were nervous about talking to me, yeah, you could talk to this guy. And literally a year to the day almost after I read that post from Mark Zuckerberg, I went on a trip to Africa, to Nigeria with Zuckerberg uh, to begin the reporting on the book. That was in 2016. And you know, maybe we'll talk about this more, but a few months later it came the election of 2016 and then uh, the book changed a lot. Uh, that changed the direction of the book as well as the direction of Facebook. Thank you. You know, I, if you I think about an organization and the head of the organization, he sets the culture for that organization. And I, I mean, I, I know he brought in, what, what's her name, Sandberg? Shell Sandberg, yeah as his um, COO, but what is, the, what is the culture at Facebook? Is it an open one? Is it a free one? Is it scared? Are they, are they frightened of Zuckerberg? Yeah, well, it's a great question. And you know, I'm glad you mentioned Cheryl because uh, Facebook was started very famously uh, in a dorm room at Harvard University. And it was started by, you know, well, Zuckerberg really was the founder but he had these co-founders who helped him out. Um, and they were uh, white guys, almost all Jewish. I think, you know, a couple of them might not have been, but, uh, um, but uh, and they were, you know, uh, ambitious kids who had um, gotten into Harvard and were excited about technology, wanted to build things. Zuckerberg had a view of, he wanted to be, uh, dominating. So he, after he started Facebook uh, in February 2004, 
before the month was out, he was expanding it outside of Harvard into other colleges. And they had this expression, move fast and break things. And it was a, a kind of a raucous place. Um, people were rewarded if they uh, did something to crash the system, system temporarily. Um, the way it works on the web is you could do that and then you know, put it back up pretty easily. There were no horrible consequences like we have today when Facebook actually is, was out for a couple hours. It still might be out. Um, and then people panic, oh my God. Um, but uh, when Sheryl Sandberg came in 2008, they very specifically like, understood they have to change that kind of dorm room culture that uh, was very much like the bros um, and make it something that could scale to a major corporation. And she immediately came in and decided, well, these women aren't empowered at Facebook. How do I make that happen? And it is pretty much of an open culture in, in a sense. People aren't afraid, afraid of Mark Zuckerberg, but um, they understand that Mark's word is law at Facebook. Um, and for many years, uh, they would, even though they had the, the new employees of Facebook, hadn't met Mark Zuckerberg, um, when you would talk to them, they would say, well, Mark says this, um, you know, like their leader, right? And they would take the cues from him. And if you walk around the hallways of Facebook, you see these posters with expressions, the kind of expressions that Mark Zuckerberg likes, were like, um, like hack, like be a hacker. And uh, what would you do if you weren't afraid? Um, it's almost like a George Orwell, big brother situation there. So the, the sayings of Chairman Mark are literally on the walls. Um, so he has a, cast a very big shadow on the Facebook culture. Uh, more recently though, as Facebook's gotten more pressure and people are questioning Facebook more, there's an element of suspicion that's permeated the culture that you didn't see earlier on. Um, and that's why maybe we'll talk about the whistleblower of Facebook. Someone like that can emerge. It was unthinkable in the earlier days of Facebook. Very good. You know, you, you mentioned one thing that he's Jewish and so is Sandberg. But what we hear from, I'm a Zionist. And I think most of the people here are very strong Zionists. And some of the things he said, I would say are not, the most, let's, shall we say, Jewish type of things. What is his philosophy? And what is Sandberg's philosophy? Well, I think they're relatively, I mean, you know, they're not Orthodox, but they're relatively ob observant Jews. And unlike some people in the technology industry who are Jewish, and you never hear them talk about, a, you know, the high holidays or, um, you know, really their faith, uh, both Mark and Cheryl will refer to it quite often. Um, I had a conversation with him. I talked to him about nine times during the course of doing this book. Um, and it was where he would talk about, um, he reflected a lot, he told me, uh, on Yom Kippur and worried whether what, the things he did had a negative impact on people. Um, I, I don't know whether he was telling me that for show, whether it was sincere, but interesting that he brought it up. Um, and uh, Cheryl's very active in Jewish organizations. Again, you know, uh, she'll, you know, uh, be very upfront about that. Um, in terms of Israel, um, I think they, you know, wa want to walk a line that, uh, whereas, they do in general is they don't want to offend people on either side of an issue. I mean, um, there was a very famous uh, a stance that Mark took uh, for many years saying people can say what they want on Facebook. They can express themselves. Um, so even though I'm Jewish, I'm not going to ban talk of Holocaust denial on Facebook. And he actually was proud of that. He, he would bring it up on, you know, uh, on his own, you know, uh, and people would say, really, that, that's a good idea. Um, yet he thought that was a good example of how uh, deeply he felt about free speech. Uh, eventually, he changed his view on that. 
and felt relatively recently, uh, only about a year ago, he uh, said that uh, no longer is Holocaust denial an accepted form of speech on Facebook. And if someone says, you know, the Holocaust didn't happen um, and someone reports it, uh, they will take that down now in, in, in Facebook. But that gives an example of how he, you know, is Jewish, but wants to um, not turn off people by saying, well, I'm Jewish and I'm going to run the company with my Jewish values. Well, that, that brought up a, a topic that I had here too. Is many criticize Facebook censorship as being biased. And I mean, the, the Holocaust is one of the other areas, one of the areas, but I know I have friends here who've been blocked off from Facebook because they're very verbal about anti-Semitism and some other things. And so that brings us to the censorship group and how effective they are and are they being unbiased or not? Okay, well, first, you know, you have to understand it's, it's a pretty complicated issue. When you use the word censorship, that's usually used in terms of the government. Of a, a, the government is an entity that has the power, you know, um, in, the, in this country, not the constitutional power, um, but in other countries, they have the power to, like in China, to limit speech on certain areas. In this country, we have the First Amendment. So we don't have the government doing that. You know, kind of, one hopes that if that happened, the Supreme Court would say, wait a minute, that's an abuse of the Constitution, which you know gives the people free speech and says the government will you know, pass no laws to abridge speech. Um, Facebook, as a private company, is free to determine what the rules are for discussion on Facebook. Now, given that, it's a very, very powerful company, uh, not just a billion, but like three billion people use it. It's international. Right, so it operates in countries that don't have the First Amendment, where you know in Turkey it's illegal to criticize you know the head of the government. Um, in you know in other countries they have laws that there's things you can't say. Facebook has to abide by them in those localities. And some people feel that given its power, uh, it shouldn't be able to pick and choose of what its own policies are. Um, and they say, we're being discriminated against. The right wing in particular says, Facebook is biased against this, which is actually provably wrong because if you look at the most popular posts on Facebook, there's a lot of right wing speakers who are the most popular. So that's kind of crazy. Um, uh, it's uh, an issue of when people post things that are wrong and maybe harmfully wrong, uh, Facebook has a right to take that down. So, for instance, in COVID, uh, if someone posts that the vaccines aren't effective, there's nothing illegal about that. Um, you know, everyone's entitled to their opinion, but it could be harmful. It could discourage someone from getting a vaccine that could save their life. And Facebook has responded to pressure and says they'll take that down. So as long as they have policies, people will say there is discrimination. And it just comes with the turf. When you're moderating the content of 3 billion people, people aren't going to like what you do. And there's going to be sometimes legitimate criticism when you don't take down things that are harmful, that maybe incite people to violence. In countries like Myanmar, um, uh, government has posted things on Facebook that led people to riot and kill people. And it's it's kind of a bad thing if you run a company and what goes on in your company helps to kill people. That, that's not a good thing. And Facebook has to deal with that. It's not an easy thing to deal with it, but it, it's Facebook's problem. One thing that came up a lot as I talked to people at Facebook is we were talking and uh, I, the things that Facebook aren't responsible for, bad things in the world, are their problem. Um, so uh, that's just the reality of the power of that platform that, you know, even though they didn't invent divisiveness, they didn't invent mis misinformation, um, they don't get into the 
the souls of evil people and cause bad things, cause them to say bad things. But they're re by posting those things and circulating them, they have some culpability and they have to answer for that. Okay. Um, Karen posted a, a question which comes in. I was going to ask a little bit later about the antitrust, but she discusses it. She's asking about Instagram. Right. Owned by Facebook and under fire for its negative impact on youth. This is sure. a new phenomenon. Um, what they acquired Instagram about five years, three, five years ago. Yeah, in 2012. Um, you know, it, it was really interesting. I, I write at length about Instagram. Um, and, you know, first of all, the circumstances under which they bought Instagram, it was really interesting. And it shows the power of Mark Zuckerberg. This was in a moment when Facebook was just about to undergo its IPO. It was about to do a public offering and make itself a public company, have shareholders, the whole bit. And uh, Zuckerberg realized, here's this young company. There's only like, a, like about 12 people working there at that time. Um, but it was really popular. Um, it was popular on mobile phones uh, in a way that Facebook wasn't yet. And people were using it based with on photographs, which is the most popular feature of Facebook. So rather than compete with Instagram, he decided to make this you know, a prohibitive offer, an offer they couldn't refuse, a billion dollars, um, and buy it, take it off the market. And uh, he promised the founders independence, um, they could grow it in a way with resources they wouldn't have otherwise, and they bought that. It was also really interesting because as the years went on, um, younger people got tired of Facebook. It wasn't cool, um, which is ironic because it started out as a college network. It was all young people. Um, and, but they liked in Instagram more because you know, it could allow them to use photographs as a form of expression. And the you know, people who ran Instagram figured out how to tap into celebrities and influencers and make it really positive. And also, uh, as we've been learning, there's like negative things to Instagram as well. Um, because it has all these cool people and showing the best sides of themselves. Um, if you're a teenage girl um, who's worried about her body image, you go to Instagram and it could be uh, that it makes you feel worse. And if you're having mental health issues, um, this just came up in that research, um, Instagram will make that worse and maybe even in some cases make you suicidal. Something again that Facebook didn't invent body image in teenage girls, but if their platform is contributing to something that might kill a teenage girl um, trying to get through a difficult passage in her life, that's something that shouldn't be tolerated. I call that a zero toleration thing where um, you don't want to be responsible for one single young girl to take her life, right? So it is a, a problem that some people say that Facebook doesn't do enough to stop. And uh, some of these documents we're seeing uh, makes it look like, hey, uh, you're not doing enough. Very good. You know, I actually saw your interview with the um, Free Library of Philadelphia, which was made immediately after your, your book was published. Mm -hmm. But there was one thing that really stuck out at me, and that was the 2016 election. The fact that Trump's election com committee was so aggressive using Facebook and Clinton was not. And maybe you want to explain that a little bit more. Sure. You know, um, you know, as I mentioned before, 2016 was a big turning point for Facebook. You know, they had um, done controversial things in the past and, and they had been actually called out for, um, you know, uh, privacy violations, a big one from the Federal Trade Commission. Um, and, uh, but they skated by all that stuff. Uh, until the 2016 election, where immediately people pointed fingers at them and saying, did you help elect Donald Trump? Were you unfairly tilting the election to Trump? 
And even some people in Facebook were upset about this. The day after election, they had this big meeting and literally people were in tears. Um, and I, I, in my research, you know, in the book, for the book, I found three ways that Facebook had a hand in the 2016 election. And the first was uh, in terms of advertising. Uh, the Trump campaign uh, understood the power of Facebook in a way the Clinton campaign did not. Nothing illegal about that. They just understood it better. And they made a huge bet on Facebook, spending millions and millions of dollars, um, really the bulk of their budget on Facebook. Um, and they learned to use it in the same way that the big corporations used it. Uh, uh, Facebook offered both campaigns, the Clinton campaign and the Trump campaign, uh, in, in their use of their employees to embed within the campaign. Trump said, yeah, let's do it. You know, we want to learn all we can. And the Clinton people said, nah, you know, we don't need it. We're cool. No problem. And uh, so the people at Facebook were in awe of the way the Trump campaign would use Facebook. Sometimes they would run as many as like, you know, like 5,000, 10,000 different ads in a given day. They test everything. Um, and uh, they would target it to people. They'd figure out with the data that Facebook offered them um, what issues people cared about. Um, and if they were, could be moved on an issue where Trump had a position, they'd show that. And they'd figure out who was never going to vote for Trump. And then they'd show them stuff that made them sick of the whole system and try to get them not to vote, to make them feel that. Um, and the people of Facebook thought, this is really interesting the way the Trump campaign is using it. They never thought Trump would win. So, you know, they didn't, they didn't do anything about it. Um, the second thing is misinformation. A lot of people posted um, uh, things with fake news stories that were anti-Clinton. Um, you know, everything from Pizzagate, she was running a, you know, like a, a child pornography ring or child trafficking ring in a pizzeria. Um, uh, just all kinds of crazy stuff, uh, negative about Clinton. Um, and most of these things weren't done um, because of a political uh, impetus, but uh, it turns out that right-wing misinformation circulates widely on Facebook, but the Democrats and left-wing, they don't like information that much, misinformation. They don't take to it the way the right does for some reason. Um, and Facebook had a choice in saying, gee, all this misinformation is going against Clinton. And we're basically giving a free platform to people telling lies about one candidate in particular. Should we do anything about it? And they decided, nah, you know, we don't want to mess with things. When actually, they were messing with things by circulating the information. And one of the big um, influencers inside of Facebook was the head of their Washington operations, who was a dyed-in-the-wool Republican. He helped um, uh, in the 2000, you know, the George W. Bush fight, you know, the election results, and um, uh, and he was very influential in saying, you know, the Facebook should cater to the right. So he said, let's not do anything. So uh, that turned out to be something that really helped Trump. And the third strain was the Russians. The Russians were circulating misinformation on Facebook. Um, now, even though I don't think that had as big an impact because there wasn't that much, um, it was something that was illegal and highly disturbing that Facebook didn't notice when it should have noticed. And when it did notice it, it was very slow to inform the public about it. You know, so those are the three ways that I think Facebook had an influence on the election um, you know, none of them particularly uh, good for society. Larry, uh, that brings up another topic, um, fake news. I mean, we see so much about fake news going on right now, and it's both from the left and from the right. Is Facebook do a, a sufficient job of fact checking to make sure that the stories they're publishing are real or not? Yeah, well, Facebook, um, after all the criticism, decided to embark on this uh, system where if people reported a story that was going to be fake news and was circulating, 
they would assign it to these organizations that they had taken on, you know, you know um, to fact check it, to say, is this story accurate or not? Um, and first of all, there's so much misinformation that they couldn't possibly fact check all of it. And then second of all, what happens if it's fact checked and people think it's wrong? At first thing they did was they said, okay, we're gonna add a little note to this. If it turns out this story is like made up, it's total bull. Um, and they're saying like, you know, well, we dispute this information. Our fact checkers say it's wrong. Then they found out when they put that on there, people would circulate it more. So that wasn't helpful. Um, so eventually they decided, well, maybe we'll like circulate it less. What can we do? We don't want to um, uh, stop people. And then they realized there were certain subjects that were so harmful to do misinformation that they should stop that. So if, they, uh, if you report election misinformation saying um, the polls are closed in this location or, you know, hey, uh, you can vote by, you know, even the, by sending in your ballot after the, the election, um, you know, just lies about that. They would take that kind of stuff down. More recently, they've taken down COVID misinformation or something. And we mentioned like Holocaust misinformation, denial. Um, that was something that they used to not flag and, and they take that down. Then again, people are criticizing them justifiably for not being aggressive enough. Um, it is a tough problem because misinformation isn't limited to Facebook. You turn on one particular cable news network and you might find things that indicate that vaccinations really don't do a good job or you know, can they be harmful to you? And um, you know, if that stuff is coming from your television set, if you know, newspaper articles can be taken out of context, the newspaper article says some one person had a bad reaction to a vaccine and then someone re re you know, posts that on Facebook without the context, um, it's tough to say, you know, wait a minute, I'm just repeating what traditional media is saying, you know, uh, how, how can you censor me? And, it, and it's a difficult problem for Facebook to tackle. Even so, a lot of people feel that Facebook hasn't done a great job at it. And by looking at the amount of misinformation on Facebook, um, it looks like they can do a better job. Really good. That brings us to a whistleblower, I guess, because she, if my understanding is correct, she claims that Facebook puts profit over public safety, public truth, whatever. I, I really, I've only heard this superficially, so I don't know any of the details. But, it, it, you know, that brings up that question is, what about this whistleblower, and is she correct in her assessment? Well, I was super interested to see uh, 60 Minutes last night. Um, you know, the Wall Street Journal over the last couple of weeks has been writing uh, stories based on the documents that she uh, took from Facebook. She's kind of like the Ed Snowden of Facebook. Um, it's very similar in that, uh, you know, she decided that people should know what's going on inside Facebook. So she became kind of like a big vacuum cleaner, uh, sucking up documents. Um, just like Ed Snowden did for the NSA. Uh, and in both cases, uh, they didn't have a, a, a very good system preventing someone from doing that. Um, and uh, as it turned out, I, I knew this woman. Uh, I literally had traveled around the world with her. About uh, 14 years ago, I went on a trip with some young Google managers that they have this program where they go around the world, they go to different international offices. So I've been around the world with this woman, and, you know, um, and 17 other young uh, managers at Google at the time. And, and I know she's a, you know, a very, um, a woman with a lot of integrity, um, with a big sense of what's right and what's wrong. And, you know, when she says that Facebook chooses profit over safety, that really resonates with a big theme in my book. I talk about many times where Mark Zuckerberg is faced with the choice of, you know, should we come out with this product or not? 
or should we alter you know the way we do things and on one hand um if you change the product um it would make facebook a safer place but people might use it less um and he is the ultimate decision maker and all too often even though some of the people around him were saying mark don't do this it's not good for the public um he would do it and that happened a number of times i don't think he's an evil person i actually enjoy conversing with him um but when those decisions come it's almost like he's got like a a good angel on his shoulder and a and the devil on his other shoulder and too often he li listens to the devil um now um there's facebook algorithms designed to promote hate i would say no the you know uh they don't they're designed to promote engagement which happens to wind up the hateful stuff gets promoted no one sits there and says um facebook how can we make more hate appear on facebook what they say is how can we get people to engage more on facebook and stay on the, the platform more um and you know make comments and you know uh, and be involved as it turns out hateful things do that so the algorithms take the things that work and promote them um and that is for profit so um uh it's something which is built into facebook that they, they make tweaks to it but it's an essential you know core of the way the company operates that i feel they have to reexamine um does face the company fuel the capital riot and this one i feel you could argue that facebook might have done a better job but uh some of the organization that goes on on facebook if there were no facebook they would have used something else to organize it so i actually i'm not as worked up about the idea that people use facebook as a medium to organize something um because um you know there's any number of communications media that people can use to get together so if it wasn't facebook it would be something else it's not like saying um you know that uh there's no other way for a group to get organized all right this kind of brings up another topic um privacy of of information and you know um the focus of advertising on people with specific ideas how does well there there are two different questions i guess first of all let's discuss privacy and i'm thinking of cambridge analytica and what went on there and they they got what something like 80 million people's information yeah so you know privacy has been an issue since day one on facebook one big irony of it is that facebook was founded um and became popular within harvard these other colleges because actually it offered more privacy than other systems um you couldn't use facebook when it came out unless uh you were a member of a given college community and you know your parents for instance couldn't see what you're doing on facebook um because they didn't have your an email um uh belonging to that individual college uh and people felt comfortable sharing things more because of that but as facebook grew they said okay at a certain point they said everyone can be on facebook um and zuckerberg himself had this philosophy that sharing more of your personal information is good for the world and facebook would encourage you to share more information and of course facebook log every single thing you did on facebook so they gather a lot of information about you and even um managed to put little um buttons little beacons on web pages that weren't on facebook uh so they'd learn about what happened when you went on the web and what you looked at there and then they would buy information from other databases like voter registration and you know uh and things from the private the services which you know uh say you know your credit ratings and things like that 
to merge with their information. So they would get a really deep dossier about you, um, really know a lot about you. Um, and it really was a privacy issue. And Facebook would always say, well, we don't sell that information to other people. Yet, if I were an advertiser and I said, I'm, I was able, I'm able to like micro target my ad. So I'd say, well, I want to go out to members of, you know, to Jewish people who like golf and drive Toyotas in Orange County. And, you know, uh, you know, I couldn't say to Facebook, here's some money, give me those names. But I could say, I want to target my ad to those people. And if someone responded to the ad, I would know that person had those attributes. So there goes the privacy. I'd even know what number, you know, the, the, the number of the phone that they used to connect with me. Um, uh, and Cambridge Analytica was a case where Facebook had a program where they let uh, outside software developers, people who wrote apps that ran on top of Facebook, um, they gave them the name, the, the information of people who signed up for those apps or surveys or whatever, and then also the information of those people's friends. So Cambridge Analytica came about when information from, that Facebook just gave away to some researcher at Cambridge University who did a, a stupid survey and everyone who signed up for that survey, was a couple hundred thousand people, gave the personal information to the researcher, but also the personal information of all their friends. And then they got the information of the friends of those friends and sooner or later had millions of people, which the guy sold to this company, Cambridge Analytica, which worked for Donald Trump. So. Uh, it, it's questionable whether that had an effect on an election, but it did underline how loose Facebook was with people's personal information. Okay, that brings up something that was also asked is, how do they focus individuals' opinions? So you can do micro-marketing or micro-targeting uh, micro of information. I'm not quite sure the question is. I mean, the, 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 I mean, basically, by knowing that, people can um, uh, target things to influence you. And that's sort of what the Trump administration did and, uh, and that what happens with anti-vaxxing and things like that. You know, Facebook says that the reason why we should be cool with this targeted approach is that uh, if we didn't do that, you would get ads that aren't relevant to you. And by seeing ads that are relevant to you, we're sending you useful services. And I'll be honest, sometimes I do buy things that, from ads I see on Facebook. If they know that I like a certain musician and want to sell me like a t-shirt I never would have seen that has that musician on it. Um, I, I'm saying, wow, that's, that's cool. I'll, I could buy that t-shirt. Um, that's a benefit to me, but it's not a benefit to me if people say, I know your weak point, I know your soft spot, and I'm going to exploit that and get you to do something you wouldn't ordinarily do. That's not a benefit to me. That's an assault on me. And that's what Facebook allows to happen. So I, I see a question here about, do you see a, a decline of Facebook as more insider information, such as your book, Facebook, the inside story, as you said, you could buy it from your local bookstore, I hope, or from uh, Amazon or whatever, um, as that stuff gets disseminated to the public? Well, that's a great question. Um, I feel um, so far it hasn't happened. And in my book, I write how, on one hand, the reputation of Facebook has really tanked, but the revenues keep going up. The stock price keeps going up. It's a trillion dollar company now. That's like a, a lot of zeros, a trillion dollar company. Um, but I do feel in the long run, it is going to have uh, a negative impact on Facebook. 
for a couple of reasons. Um, one is the, the regulators are lining up against Facebook. They might constrain it. And I think a really serious thing is that the people who work for Facebook um, are questioning Facebook from the inside. And some, a lot of them are leaving. And in order for Facebook to keep doing what it does, is stay competitive, it's got to hire the best and brightest. And more and more, if I were a great artificial intelligence scientist, I would look for places, you know, I had a choice of many places that wanted to hire me. And I would say, why do I want to work for this place? I go home to my family and they'd say, you know, you're working for this awful place. You know, uh, why, why do that? So it's going to be tough. Okay. One of the um, questions that came up is, do you think Congress should exert greater control over Facebook and similar outlets? I guess this ties to the famous section, was it 230 and yeah. the Trade Commission, whatever? Yeah, um, well, I mean, certainly as you see by the volume of hearings and, um, and reports, uh, both in Congress, um, Federal Trade Commission, um, the, you know, Facebook is getting more scrutiny. Um, now this 230 you mentioned, I, I'm a little wary about coming down on Facebook for that. And I'll tell you why. First of all, a little primer. This thing called Section 230. It was part of the 1996 Telecommunications Act. At the time this was passed, the internet was just getting off the ground. And people worried that here's a medium that allows people to post things on their own um, and it, companies that give people a voice are going to be constrained if they're responsible for every random thing that somebody says it could be a nut somewhere um, before they could uh, even look at the post. So a company like Facebook with like 15 billion posts a day, you know, how could they be like a newspaper, or Wired magazine, where I work and look carefully at something and say, you know, well, uh, we have to make sure that this doesn't defame anyone um, or, you know, violate rules. So what they did was they said, these companies, these platforms aren't responsible. The speaker bears responsibility. Um, if it's illegal content, then the companies, when they learn about it, they have to take it down. But, um, you know, it's more of a medium like the phone. When you talk into a phone, the phone company isn't responsible. Now people are saying, nah, nah, you know, that period has passed. We have to control, you know, uh, we have to let the, the companies be responsible for it. I think that's a, that, that would be a bad thing. It would sort of end not only Facebook, but all social media. Um, I'm up with people being responsible for what they say. And I'm up for being for companies being responsible citizens, but I'm not quite ready to end the era where people can speak um, and with this, you know, like amazing megaphone of the internet. Um, so um, a lot of people are talking about ending Section 230 or like limiting, and I think that would have an un bad unintended consequences. An ally topic that's, <clears throat> excuse me, um, ally topic I'm sure it's near and dear to you is people are asking now that um, journalistic impunity be, you can charge them with libel for saying things in the, in the press. How do you feel about that personally being a journalist? Well, I mean, that's something that I live with every day. I mean, you know, you don't libel people. You know, I mean, it, it's, we follow the law and responsible journalists um, uh, do their best to, you know, uh, be super careful when we're writing something about someone, which is defamatory, um, uh, if it's wrong. Um, in those cases, you take real careful, you know, steps to make sure that you know what you're talking about. Um, because if you intentionally write a falsehood and you publish it, you're responsible. Um, uh, we've seen cases where, you know, I mean, right now, 
um, to take one case, uh, you know, some people who were defending Trump after the election and blamed it on this election uh, technology company, they're being sued for defaming the company because uh, they accused it of a crime and were wrong. And, you know, and that, that's, that's defamatory. Um, I think, you know, if I, if I write something in a Facebook post or a Twitter post that's defamatory, it's up to me to be responsible for it. Um, and if I'm found to be guilty of libel, then the company should take down the post, be, you know, forced to take down the post once they, they know about that. Okay. Um, what is the Supreme Court of Facebook, this, this oversight committee, and how much influence do they have on what Facebook presents to the public? Yeah, one thing that Facebook did was um, uh, they, they, they had, uh, they call it an independent oversight board um, that uh, they set up, they gave it some money up front so it wouldn't be a case where if this board said something that Facebook didn't like, they could cut the funding out. So there's no funding for five years. And um, it operates on its own. Face and, and what they do is they look at decisions that Facebook made over specific pieces of content and they can overrule it. But Facebook says, this we're taking this post down it violates our policy um and someone appeals um and the oversight board agrees to look at this case they could say facebook you are wrong for taking it down you have to put it back up or vice versa someone says you know facebook you know there's something on facebook that uh, you know uh that's hate speech that bullies me um and facebook wouldn't take it down the oversight board can say take it down and face, the board can also uh, uh, make a recommendation saying, hey, uh, change the policy uh, about this. You know, not only did you do this wrong, but your policy's wrong. Uh, and in that case, Facebook agrees to look at its policy, but doesn't agree to change it and says, well, if we reject your recommendation, then we'll tell you why. So it has limited power. But what I find interesting about the board is that early, right from the get-go, they're skeptical of Facebook and they're using their position uh, to be critical of Facebook and you know, in ways that Facebook might not like. So it's interesting to see how that, that develops. Very good. Uh, yeah, you're gonna to have to talk up loud. People can't hear very well. Uh, people can't hear me? No, it's yeah. not you, it's from me. Okay. Board is made up of five people. Who picks these people? Yeah, who picks the people on the board? Well, it, 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 that's, a, it, that's a great question because it was like a big controversy. It took them years to set up this board to get it, to do all the things. And you know, so the question is, if Facebook picks all the people, then are they biased? So Facebook sort of first helped pick the people who are going to be the chair people, and then they pick people. And, you know, it, it, it was sort of this dance that they're like, you know, semi, you know, authorized by Facebook. And then, you know, um, the idea is, as this thing goes on, um, you know, it'll be the fourth generation of people picking other people and they'll be less beholden. Um, but Facebook, uh, the people aren't like stooges. Um, and, you know, I think their main concern, I've talked to people on the board, is that they not be seen as puppets of Facebook. Okay. Any follow-ups then? Well, I just wanted to get some sort of idea of their background. He's background asking, background of, the, of the board members? Yeah. Well, some of them are from the human rights community. There are some who are uh, like lawyers, law professors. Um, there's the former prime minister of Denmark. Um, you know, uh, you know, some of these people are pretty prominent. Okay. Um, what did Mark think about your book? Because it sounds like your book is, has 
positive and negative points about Facebook in there. Yeah, I mean, so the ground rules for me were, I would get this access, um, but I would write whatever I wanted. It would not be submitted to Facebook for their approval. They didn't say it until it was literally bound into covers. Maybe out a week before we released it to the public, I sent you know a couple of these hardbound, can't change it, um, you know uh, copies. I fact checked the book. I hired people to fact check everything I wrote. You know that's a, a, a responsible nonfiction writer does. And we gave a big list of questions to Facebook, saying, "Is this you know you know uh, can you verify this? Can you verify that? I'm saying this. Do you want to?" Do you have a you know uh, your own view? Do you want to respond to this? Um, and uh, the book, my implicit promise though was that I would be fair. And my long career in as a journalist, um, uh, I felt convinced them to give me that access because of that. And I think the book was fair. It's very critical of Facebook, um, but. Um, they saw firsthand how serious I was about trying to get to the truth. And you know, maybe a couple of weeks after the book came out, you know, Mark uh, messaged me. You know, we messaged back and forth sometimes. I have a channel to him. Um, and he said, well, I read the book. Uh, and he said, there's a lot I disagree with. You know, I think I dispute some of it, but I understand how hard you tried to be fair and, and get things right. So I appreciate that. And then, yeah, you know, I, I give him credit for that. Very good. Um, we have so much polarization in this country. Do you think Facebook is being used to continually polarize or widen the divide in, in, in the country or is it trying to do something to stop that? Yeah, I think it, it, it contributes to the polarization. I mean, I think, um, and that's because the polarizing things written on Facebook get more traction. And, you know, uh, again, no one sat down in Facebook and said, gee, um, how do I write something, you know, write a product feature that's going to increase polarization in the United States and make us, you know, go at each other's throats? No, instead they said, you know, when Facebook first discovered, I write about this in the book, when Facebook first discovered how things can go viral within the system, they thought that was fantastic. Because the kinds of things that went viral were fun things like, um, you know, like a, like a post where people put rubber bands around a watermelon and, and saw how many rubber bands you could use before the melon explodes. And in a political sense, they liked it when things went viral in Arab Spring. They thought it's a way that people can extend democracy. Um, so, uh, and that kept people on the system. Growth and retention is what is important to Facebook. And um, it just so happens that the posts that are divisive um, engage people, infuriate people, make them want to spend more time there because they get worked up. They have, want to say something back um, where they like, uh, like add to it. They get worked up and they spend more time on it. Um, that happens to be good for Facebook in the sense that people spend more time and um, look up more ads. Um, and, uh, you know, the question is how far will Facebook go to mitigate that? Um, and the answer seems to be um, not so far as to make people spend less time there. Okay. You know, we talked about the 2016 election. I know your book was published before the 2020, but had things changed between the 2016 and the 2020 elections and the political use of Facebook? Well, yeah. Um, well, I guess the Democrats figured out that it's important to use Facebook. Uh, that was one thing. Um, so the Trump campaign didn't have that kind of advantage. Um, they spent more resources in trying to police election misinformation. 
But there were new issues. They got in, pro in trouble because Mark Zuckerberg had this idea that um, we shouldn't mess with having to fact check what politicians say. Um, so if someone posts you know, a political ad, uh, which tells an outright lie, um, it's not up to us to take it down. You know, that's political speech. People will figure it out. Um, and that didn't win people's hearts. Um, and, you know, because especially since, you know, it turns out the fact is that misinformation, as I said earlier, it just so happens that one side of the political spectrum um, gets a benefit out of it that the other side doesn't. So that stance of Zuckerberg's that he really held to, um, you know, uh, turned out to be de facto uh, benefit for one side. So, um, you know, a, somewhat of a mixed uh, record in terms of the 2020 election. Okay. Um, I just had an idea I had a mind fart. <laughs> At my age, it happens. <laughs> um, okay, well, let's get back to this breaking up of Facebook. Has Facebook gotten too large to be broken up by antitrust? Has it become too ubiquitous in this world for us to break it apart? Well, I mean, if... I mean, there's a precedent for breaking up companies. Uh, they broke up the phone company, um, uh, but ultimately the phone company figured out a way to get back together. Um, the Microsoft was ordered to break up, but they uh, kept appealing until a new administration came and said, well, you don't have to break up anymore. Um, to break up a company like Facebook um, and the way people talk about it being broken up would be um, the split off Instagram and WhatsApp, which is another a big messaging uh, application that's super popular uh, overseas. Um, uh, it has over, both those have over a billion people. Um, and that would be uh, certainly a big move, but it would be one it would take years and years and years uh, to get it through the courts. We'd have to win, the government would have to win the case and get it through the courts. Um, and by then, who knows, maybe, you know, TikTok would be more powerful than Facebook. So it's tough to do. Um, I think where all this goes, in my opinion, is some sort of settlement where Facebook agrees to make some more significant changes than it's made in the past. Um, uh, so changes that really shift the way it operates and sets it back at least temporarily um, in terms of their revenues. Um, and, you know, I think that would be good for Facebook. I think it'd be good for Facebook to sort of do a restart um, and, uh, and sort of address these long-term problems it has that make people unhappy with it, uh, even as they use it. Um, so I don't think we're gonna see Facebook broken up. I think we're gonna um, see a long process that'll lead to some sort of settlement. Well, that ties into a television commercial I saw from Facebook saying, we have not looked at regulation of the internet in 25, 30 years. And they're kind of indicating that they want it. So why are they not self-imposing this on themselves uh, on themselves? Well, they don't they don't want to be have to regulate themselves and then have their competitors not regulated. So um, a lot of the things that they want in terms of regulation are some things they voluntarily um, decided to do that their competitors haven't done. So they see regulation as a way to lock in their gains um, as opposed to constrain themselves. Um, the regulation that they suggest uh, isn't regulation that would cause them pain. 
Okay, makes sense. Hasn't Facebook been lost um, uh, antitrust suits in the EU, EU? Yeah, it has. I mean, they've, they've, there's been a number of cases internationally against Facebook, um, and they paid billions of dollars in fines. Some of them they're appealing. Um, they paid billions of dollars of fines in the U.S. Um, uh, but that's minuscule because they make so much money. Never mind. I just kind of find that hard to believe. Anybody else have a question? Now, Karen asks, did Facebook supply Trump people with people's political information, political briefs? Believe. Well, no, no, no. They, they, they don't give the information away, but they give access to the people with certain attributes. And then, as I said before, there's a way around that. You know, if they are um, saying uh, targeting an ad to people of a very specific type. They say, boy, we want to find out where the real Trump supporters are, you know, to, you know, kind of put them on our lists. Um, uh, and they send out these micro ads. Um, anyone who responds to that individual ad gives away all the information that was in the targeting standards, you know, the targeting criteria. So, you know, sort of, it's like a bank shot where Facebook does get that information. Um, you know, again, it's not just the Trump, it's anyone who, uh, you know, advertises on Facebook can extract that information through that loophole. Okay. And then um, how did the Russians in the 2016 election, um, I, I understand the Russians put anti-Trump advertisements and news stories in there, but how, how- Well, anti-Clinton, not anti-Trump. And how, how much did it influence the election? I don't, I, I don't think directly that they, those Russian ads had as much impact as the misinformation and certainly not as the, you know, uh, huge advertising effort that, that, that Trump had. Um, uh, but again, it's an illegal and alarming that um, the Russians used an American social media platform um, illegally to try to affect the election. Um, and they sort of made a template for ways that can go through American citizens to do the same thing. So was it wasn't a good thing. Okay. And I think you mentioned in your um, talk in Philadelphia that the people who put these bots uh, for the Russians or in the U Ukraine, whatever, became millionaires from these bots that they put on to, to Facebook. Mike, you, you want to explain that? Yeah, it wasn't the bots, it was the misinformation I talked about earlier. So if you posted something saying that like the Pope endorsed Donald Trump or, you know, said so something about horrible Hillary Clinton um, and you made up a publication that didn't exist, so basically you would write a story that didn't exist and attribute it to a publication that didn't exist. There was something called the, like some guy made up called the Dem Denver Tribune. And it had this anti-Hillary story that got a lot of hits. And there is no Denver Tribune. It sounds real. Um, and they had the address in the advertising it turned to be the address of a parking lot. Um, and millions of people clicked on this. It was more popular than any story that the Washington Post published about the election. Um, but what happened was when you clicked on it, you went to the page for this fake news story and there were ads on the page and the person who put it up collected money from the advertisers. So a lot of it came from this little town in Macedonia. People are driving around limousines in this little town in Macedonia because they got rich from this misinformation. I love that. That's so good. It shows how, how gullible we are in many respects, doesn't it? Well, it shows, I mean, we're, we live in this crazy science fiction world with things that you couldn't imagine. And that's one thing which is so fascinating about covering this technology. You know, the, the, the people, and I've been covering this stuff for decades, 
And it gets crazier and crazier. I mean, things that used to be in the science fiction that I read in college, like Robert Heinlein, you know, it dwarfs that. This summer I went to this little town in Texas and watched Jeff Bezos shoot himself to outer space. That's like stuff from a Bond movie. Um, yeah, and, you know, so I, I'm really lucky to be writing nonfiction, non-fake news about the craziest stories of our time that wind up impacting us day to day. Someone asked for a 10 to 15 minute summary of my book. I'm hoping you're getting some of a summary right here. Um, I hope you buy the book and spend a few hours with it because, you know, I, I tell the story like a novel, even though everything's true. Um, and, you know, because it's, it's an amazing narrative that could only happen in the 21st century with the internet and with the way that we consume it and the way it consumes us. And here's your chance to look inside this company and see how it happened and what these people are like and, you know, and, and how they built a machine that they can't possibly control. Well, I'm thinking of Google and, or Alphabet, whatever they call themselves now, and uh, even TikTok. I mean, these, these guys are growing so big, or Twitter. Um, is there any way we can control these, these mega corporations that make up uh, the, the bulk of the um, uh, stock market and the, the, the um, S&P 500? Yeah, we can make better laws and we can enforce the laws we have. That's the bottom line. I mean, you know, if we had laws about privacy that said you can't collect this information without my permission, you have to like you can't say, um, you know, you, you can't let them collect it and then later have, ask me, is it okay if we did this? I mean, before you collect the information, say, hey, are you okay with this? Before you track me on the internet, to say, here's we're going to track you on the internet. Do you want to do that? Not give me a fifty-page document that you know, I have to look at, you know, can, you know can, I'll never look at. Um, pass better laws, the SEC, the financial stuff. We have all these laws that we don't enforce, you know? So let, you know, it, it really is something that we do have control. You know, Facebook is not gonna intentionally violate the law. If we did better laws about privacy, Facebook would follow them. Stand so, I, I, so I find a lot of this posturing in these hearings from Congress saying, you know, to Facebook, you know, uh, why do you do this? Why do you do that? You know, I have a question for these people in Congress is saying, why aren't you passing the laws to protect us? Stan, you have a question. You're going to have to talk I'm very loud. Why would these advertise, advertise on fake news uh, and once they find out it's fake news, why don't they remove their advertisement to get rid of it? Well, you, I, I think you're asking, tell me you're right. Why would an advertiser want to appear alongside a fake piece of news? Is that and, the question? And then, and then, and then, and then when he finds out it's fake, fake, he doesn't back why out. Why they remove it? Well, the way the ad system works that we built, we have an insane way of serving ads where advertisers don't know what content their advertising appears uh, beside. You know, this offends me. I, I work for a magazine, or what used to be known as a magazine. I work for a brand now. Um, and the, you know, when someone takes out an ad in Wired Magazine, um, and we put them next to something, you know, which is a, a disturbing piece of content, uh, they complain to the ad sales people and saying, well, what about this and that? So people have control over that. Um, if, if we had a, like a, a story which was like made of lies and the advertiser would appear next to it, they would complain um, because they want their stuff beside that and they have control over that. Um, but on the internet, you don't do that. You put your ad in some big pile that gets put up for auction when the kind of person you target it opens up, you know, uh, the browser. So basically you're not targeting the content, you're targeting the people and it's irrelevant what the content's gonna be. 
So, you know, it's something that the, the, a lot of advertisers have difficulty with. It, it's a crazy system. It's, it's a big pull. I guess my, my final question to you is, what do you feel about the future of these high-tech companies like Facebook, Google, and so forth? And what's, what's going to be happening to our, you know, they've, they've interacted into our society. They become so intermeshed with everything we do. And you see kids, well, I don't know how many kids I missed on in the, in the street because they're all watching, reading Google or texts on their phone. And no one seems to be paying attention to the world any longer. And there's people complaining about that we've lost the ability of our, ourselves by not communicating directly to see emotion and understand emotion. Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. You know, it's kind of funny. One of the things that came out from the whistleblower documents that she took from Facebook was that they had this meeting um, about, uh, you know, how to get Facebook, you know, uh, to, to be a habit for younger people, even kids. And they were saying, wow, you know, we've been like researching like play dates or like when people get together and they don't look at their phones enough. Well, you know, what's the matter with these kids that in these play dates were, they're talking to each other. We've got to stop that. You know, you know, like, my God, there's a moment in the, the life of a teenager where they're not looking at a phone. You know, this is terrible. Um, you know, but, Believe me, as, as everyone knows, with your kids, your grandkids, they look at the phone plenty. And I wish I could say people are going to, you know, go in the opposite direction. I think there will be pockets that say, hey, we're going retro. We're not going to look at technology so much. But that's not the trend line. The trend line is more and more and more. The next big product isn't phones, but glasses. The Internet's going to be on our glasses. Um, instead of just looking at, you know, at a screen on a, like a piece of, you know, metal and, and gorilla glass, you're going to be looking at it from, you know, something in, in, in your glasses, even if you don't have a prescription, you'll be wearing them to be able to, to see not only a, like a, a screen, but you'll be seeing things in your room and the street that aren't really there, that are virtual. That is our destiny as human beings, and it's not a happy one. So have a great day. <laughs> Does anybody have a one last question for, for Stephen before we say goodbye? Good to do. Anybody at home? I don't see any hands raised here. Okay, well, th thanks very much. I really appreciate it.